story. Today, uh, my da- my guest is David McGowan. David McGowan is, um, in the last couple of years, has been uh, researching and putting out information on his Center for an Informed America website uh, about Laurel Canyon. Laurel Canyon is something we touched on the other day, and we talked quite a bit about it, actually, and we kind of went through, you know, uh, some of David's information and, you know, then my own information about having lived in the area um, and, and remembering some of the days uh, 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 long ago. Uh, Dave also um, is the author of uh, three books, uh, the latest Program to Kill, Understanding the F Word and Derailing Democracy. Uh, these are also available on his site, the Center for an Informed America, and we have a link up on our site. But before I get into that any further, we've got him right here. Let's go ahead and go to a uh, very special guest, David McGowan. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's, you know, the information just when it when I encountered it, it, it was so kind of over the top for me having, like you, lived there, having been through the canyon, having been through Laurel Canyon, having li- been a part of the kind of the culture, having known about this, having experienced the darkness of it and the, and the deaths all over the place. And then you've been grappling with it, you know, making all these connections in your research, which is excellent. And I mean, just you've let the research speak for itself. But um, how did you get, you know, I know you're also a native uh, Angelino uh, or at least Southern Californian. How did you get interested in Laurel Canyon? Uh, it actually was kind of happened by accident. I am uh, a native uh, Angelino, born and raised. Uh, I've lived in the greater LA area for uh, almost 50 years now, uh, about the first 30 in the South Bay and then uh, the last 20 uh, up in the San Fernando Valley. And I uh, lived, you know, lived around and driven through Laurel Canyon for, you know, all of my life pretty much and uh, never, never really gave it a second thought. And how it actually came about was uh, a couple of years ago, uh, my wife and I were getting ready to go on vacation and uh, my oldest daughter uh, gave me a uh, book, Laurel Canyon, written by... Um, Michael Walker, I believe it is, uh, who wrote this, what, what was really kind of the first account of this whole scene that was going on there in Laurel Canyon. And, of course, it was a very mainstream uh, account, uh, you know, certainly not, not, not the uh, conspiracist uh, point of view. But anyway, she got me this book, and it, it was supposed to just be light reading, you know, about this the emergence of the uh, the rock and roll scene and the Sunset Strip scene and the hippies and whatnot. And uh, it was supposed to be a break, <laughs> you know, from all the insanity, just some light reading to, you know, <laughs> lounge on the beach on vacation and read. And instead... Uh, as I was going through reading it, there were just alarm bells going off all over the place on all these little tantalizing little uh, bits and pieces that he threw in there but left unexplored, basically. And uh, it just the more I read this book, the more uh, I realized that there was a big, big story there beyond uh, the one that he was telling. And uh, by the time I got home from vacation, I was just like, just trying to find everything I could find, every book, magazine article, newspaper article, web post, any, everything and anything and everything I could find on that scene uh, to sort of flesh out the, uh, the details that had been hinted at, uh, just barely hinted at. I mean, most people would read this book and think nothing out of it, but, you know, that's not the way my mind works. And... For me, there was just alarm bells going off everywhere uh, as I read this, and and so for the next uh, like two years, um, I just I researched everything I could find on the subject. I spent a lot of time physically up there, just kind of getting a feel for the place, and you know, and 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 visiting some of these uh sort of historical places like the old Houdini mansion, the former site of the log cabin, the site where the Wonderland murders occurred, uh, you know, various places like that. And uh the more I looked at it, the more amazed I was at at uh 
this, this huge story that was lurking there that, that had gone like completely, and, and I, I was kind of offended, <laughs> actually, in a way uh, that, you know, I mean, I've been immersed in this stuff for quite a while. I consider myself to be, you know, pretty knowledgeable about these types of things. And it was almost kind of a, kind of an insult, kind of offen- <laughs> offensive to me to think that this huge story had unfolded literally right in my backyard, and I and nobody else really uh, had ever really looked into it and and knew any knew really anything about it. This whole sort of backstory to what uh, to the story that's been told in the mainstream press. It, so it, it, uh, it, that's that's it, basically where it came from. And I think the big story here is the not not just the tie-ins, but first of all, what what hits you right off the bat is the amount of death. I mean, you know, on top of all the the fantastic stuff of the, you know the birth of the hippie generation, all the music that came out of there, the birth of F- FM radio came about that time too. All that was happening, and and yet the deaths. And now you mention here, I, I you know just just we, we go through some you know the, the obviously the one we've talked covered here lately from a, a few different angles is, you know, the Sharon Tate situation um, and LaBianca murders Manson. And you, you actually tie Manson in a lot more into the music scene and into people knowing him and into the Canyon than anybody else ever did. I'm not even sure anyone else really tied him to the Canyon so much. Oh yeah. He was definitely, uh, he, he was definitely known to hang out at uh, Mama Cass's house. Uh, in Laurel Canyon with her uh, entourage, which was right across the street from a home that was being rented at the time by um, uh, Abigail Folger, the coffee heiress, and her boyfriend, uh, Wojtek Frykowski, who were two of the victims of that. So, yeah, there they were, they were a lot of times. The, the murders, those murders actually occurred in Benedict Canyon, which is a few canyons over, right. but... Uh, Actually, the Laurel Canyon story is sort of bookended, uh, and that was one of the, one of the things that, that Walker did point out in his book, mm-hmm. was that that whole scene was sort of bookended by two of the most notorious, grisly, bloody mass murders in L.A.'s history, the first of which was the, uh, the Manson killings, uh, which both the alleged perpetrators, and I'm still not convinced that the, the Manson family actually did that, by the way, but that's a whole other story. Okay, that, no, that I would be... I, well, I think there were other actors probably involved, but anyway, um, that that uh, kind of came at, at the, near the beginning of the, of the heyday of uh, Laurel Canyon, and uh, the wonder, what were known as the Wonderland, or the Four on the Floor murders, uh, which was... Uh, uh, when um, some guys uh, went into a home uh, occupied by a gang of drug dealers and uh, just literally beat them uh, to a pulp with uh, lead pipes. And it actually has been two movies um, based on that. One, uh, Wonderland, starring Val Kilmer, which is actually a pretty good one that, yeah. that's... Uh, a fairly accurate uh, retelling of the crime, which involved John Holmes, the porn star, and it was just this real sordid tale. And also, uh, Boogie Nights actually uh, is a sort of a fictionalized, uh, contains a fictionalized version of those murders. But so those, uh, you know, those two big, huge, high-profile, bloody mass murders. Uh, the first one was uh, five victims. The second one was four. Those were both directly connected to Laurel Canyon, and in between those, there was just an astounding array of deaths of people either killed in the canyon or people living in or connect deeply connected to the canyon uh, killed elsewhere. Just, I mean, just a stunning array of, of uh, bo- uh, both uh, names that people would know, like you know, the old silent film star R- Ramon Navarro oh. and uh, actress Inga Stevens and a few others uh, who were killed in their homes in the canyon and, and just various other. Well, the, just, wasn't just, just a withering array of. Yeah, death. you've got Minio, but Linkletter. Wasn't Linkletter called a suicide? Uh, Linkletter's daughter? Yeah, Diane Linkletter. Yeah, she was, hers was right at the mouth of Laurel Canyon. She, <laughs> uh, yeah, allegedly. 
uh, committed suicide uh, either accidentally or intentionally when she was out of her mind on LSD, supposedly. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, there's a whole other story to that in that she wasn't alone when it happened, and the guy that she happened to be with was later connected, was later the only witness to another uh, celebrity death. And uh, and there was another death in the Linkletter family also, right in close proximity to uh, Diane's death, uh, like a, a brother-in-law or something who supposedly shot himself in the head. So there was a whole... As always, there was a whole other story to that as well. But yeah, that that uh, that one was uh, a Laurel Canyon death. Sal Minio's uh, death uh, was at the mouth of Laurel Canyon. Inga Stevens and Ramon Navarro both uh, both killed in their homes in uh, Laurel Canyon. Um, just a whole, just a lot of them. Just a staggering array of, and also you know like. Uh, has, uh, like wives, wives of uh, wives and girlfriends yes. Yes. seem to have. <laughs> That's an amazing. Seem to have gotten whacked quite a bit. I think yeah. for one of Crosby's and uh, uh, Jackson Brown's wife. And, and then Jackson Brown. Here we have another one tying into the uh, old money L.A., which is really not old. It's it's kind of like old money transplanted to L.A. in the twenties and thirties. And um, the rise of this, what I might call the L.A. Mafia. And, uh, and you know, in- interestingly enough, Linkletter himself was tied more to the, to the establishment. Um, and then that establishment, as you pointed out, also goes to military intelligence. <laughs> so, you know. Well, yeah, I, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, another thing. There's just. And the, there's but, a, there's uh, a, well, well, another one thing that just really amazed me was how many of these people – uh, these Hollywood personalities, both both in the music field and in the uh, in the acting field, the so-called Young Turks, uh, yeah. Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper and Bruce Dern and Sharon Tate actually and Jane Fonda and, and all of them uh, who uh, who traveled in the same circles as the Laurel Canyon musicians and some of them even lived in Laurel Canyon. In fact, some of them even tried to be musicians themselves. Peter Fonda released a, a mm-hmm. folk album back in those days yeah. when he was living in the canyon, hanging out with all these people. But uh, what amazed me was that virtually all of them, all of the big names, I mean, you'd be hard-pressed to find one who isn't, are sons and daughters of the military intelligence establishment. Mm-hmm. I mean, just right down the line, it's it just... Uh, I was amazed and at how how little digging it actually took to to find that out, and just you know going through all of these these people, you know the 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 the, the heads of the, you know the, the figureheads of all of the big Laurel Canyon bands, uh, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention, uh, John Phillips with the Mamas and the Papas, Jim Morrison with the Doors. David Crosby with the Birds, Stephen Stills with Buffalo Springfield, and on and on and on. Every one of these guys, right down the line, is uh, is a product of the military intelligence establishment, which is the and, es- I mean, that, establishment. At some yeah. point, you know, at first, you know, people are, you know, a few names. Well, that's just a coincidence. That's well, you know, maybe it's, at some point, it's like how many coincidences does it take to make a conspiracy? You know, and it's it's. At some point, uh, I passed that threshold a long time ago with yeah. this with this story because it's just I just I find it very hard to believe that the only people in the country that had musical talent and were actively promoted in those days just coincidentally happened to be you know sons and daughters daughters of the the military intelligence community and if you look at them they're every every. Damn near every one of them. Uh, Jackson Brown, we already mentioned, Emmy Lou Harris, just on and on and on. Every, every one of these uh, and, and yet the, the public just accepts them like they're just coming from all over the United States, just, you know, poor boy made good type of thing. And uh, just stumbled into stardom out there, you know, with my guitar. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> they just yeah, it's just like uh, they just all came flocking in from yeah. all across the country and even from Canada and, and elsewhere uh, uh, to L.A. Well, Canada in, in, in this uh, time frame of the yeah. mid '60s, yeah. 
Uh, despite the fact that L.A. was not really known as a music mecca back then, they did not. There was not a lot of recording facilities and and uh, performing venues and whatnot. And, and it, L.A. wasn't really that much on the map. Yeah, you had the Troubadour, you had uh, the Whiskey, and um, I'm just trying. You know, you had the bigger venues like you know there was always the the the, the L.A. Forum and I guess in, beginning in the 70s. Um, you had, uh, I'm just trying to think of some, you didn't have anything like the blues, uh, 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 you know, the, uh, the blues clubs or anything like that. It was just, uh, most people would play, I say at the Troubadour or the whiskey, the whiskey wasn't like in those days breaking open, um, new band. They were really having established groups there, not for new acts. Like now I think it, it became at one time a, a pay to play place. Yeah. But but then you know you'd have name acts, uh, and of course all the Sunset Strip. I mean you've you also have done the kind of iconography or, uh, of the Sunset Strip where you had all these establishments and all these places along the strip. I mean then you had the Playboy Club. Maybe it's still there. You had um, Ben Frank's, which is one of the one of the hangouts, I suppose. You, yeah, it was a huge. Yeah, that was uh, sort of an after party hangout. Yeah. yeah. Till late. Then then there was. Um, uh, Tower Records was also going in at that time, became a big kind of hub. But even before that, in the 60s, before Re- Tower Records went in, you had, um, you know, a few head shops along the way. I guess that was along uh, um, where the Pandora's box was, became like a empty lot. I don't even know what it is now. You 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 would know. But, I mean, back in those days. Uh, it's actually a traffic island. It's, it's yeah. in, in the middle of, uh, it's, it's. Yeah, it's, it's where it used to be is now uh, in the middle of a main street. It's uh, like a little traffic island. It, it, it's it's doors box used to be. Yeah, yeah and so enough. but so it wasn't really much though. I mean, like you wouldn't look at the Sunset Strip like you would today. It's all because in the eighties it really went through this big time money transformation. But in those days, yeah, well, no, yeah, not at all. I mean, Nashville was and is the the center for country music, and uh, um, I'm drawing a blank here. The, the center for Motown uh, was sort of, you know, the the that was the epicenter of you know the the soul music scene, and pop music was pretty much uh, New York back then. So there was no real compelling reason that somebody, you know, I want to be a rock star. I think I'm going to go to LA, you know, but yeah. yet they all came pouring in and all at the same time. And they all congregated in Laurel Canyon for the most part. And they all, for the most part, all came from military intelligence families. And some of them, a lot of them actually, even knew each other uh, previously. Like Jim Morrison had actually attended uh, kindergarten with Frank Zappa's wife, or the the girl who would become Frank Zappa's wife. And then they end up, you know, 20 years later, they end up neighbors in in Laurel Canyon, you know, and that's just entirely coincidental. You know, uh, just like everything is. So Okay, so why do you think that, was this a conscious movement on the part of uh, you think people that wanted to start their own record companies, or do you? What's behind it all? Why were these people chosen? And then I'm going to get into the deaths of the boyfriends and girlfriends and things a little bit later. But why um, have you come to any conclusion as to why? Uh, I believe basically what it boils down to is that the establishment knew that there was going to be growing opposition uh, to the war in Vietnam. And they knew that there was going to be a very vocal and very aggressive uh, resistance and sort of a a countercultural movement. And so they sort of just preemptively got in there and created it themselves so that they'd be able to control it. This kind of the way I see it. They 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 wanted to you know to uh, to head off this this anti-war movement that they knew was going to develop and and limit the damage that it could do and control it as much as possible. I believe, and so uh, the way to do that was through uh, these rock stars being sort of promoted as uh, countercultural icons to create this whole sort of 60s 
hippie flower child uh, countercultural movement, which I do not believe was organic in any way. I used to. I used to believe that it was basically an organic movement that was later co-opted. Um, but I, at this point, I, I think the whole thing was sort of uh, concocted right from the start. Mm-hmm. Uh, and looking at Jimi Hendrix's death, for example, just, you know, I, I'm just going to dive in because you've got to see David McGowan's uh, info on this. He's got many, many chapters all available uh, from his site, which I guess we just call, um, uh, well, well, let me give the link. It's it's davesweb.cnchost.com. That's davesweb.cnchost.com. Go there, and you can read this information for yourself. And while you're at it, go ahead and check his books out there as well. Um, I'm going to dive in here. Uh, it's it's all so much that I could talk to you for a, you know a long time on a lot of this <laughs> because you know you've done an incredible job. Uh, I you know a guy like you is it's just what was needed back then. You know you're doing it now, but. Uh, boy, I wish I had come across personally on a personal level here. I wish I had come across this information back, you know, about 1975, let's say. <laughs> I, I, I think w- it was a very well-crafted illusion. And I, yes. I think a, a mistake that a lot of people make nowadays is equating the anti-war movement with the hippie flower child movement and viewing them as sort of one and the same. And I think that was the goal of the program, uh, um, but that wasn't the way that it was originally. The, the anti-war movement was a separate, uh, a separate, something quite separate, and the hippies just kind of came along sort of out of nowhere and co-opted it. And I think that was quite deliberate because they wanted to give the anti-war movement a face that would be completely unacceptable to mainstream America. And so what we had, what we had got were these hippies that, I mean, everything about them was offensive to sort of, uh, you know, middle America. If, I mean, the hairstyles, the clothing styles, the, the uh, you know, the open drug use, the music, the language, I mean, everything about them was designed, I think, to repel mainstream America and and keep the prevent the anti war movement from gaining any additional speed by putting this unattractive face on it or a face that would be very unattractive to the majority of Americans at that time. So you and, think uh, that's so I, I think the whole hippie flower child thing with the music and the, and the, everything that went with it was was a creation of the intelligence community uh, to take the steam out of the anti-war movement okay. and various other movements that were going on at the time, uh, black empowerment, the women's rights movement, uh, civil rights movement, all, all these all these different uh, all these different things that were kind of coming to a head in the sixties, which were legitimate movements, and all of that kind of got co-opted by the hippie flower child thing. Okay, and then it grew. I guess it took on a life of its own. But, okay, the deaths. If you're in a military operation, then you would expect that, okay, in dealing with a military operation, there are going to be deaths. When you look yeah. at this from a military point of view, you can see, oh, okay, collateral damage. We had to kill so-and-so because they knew this. We had to kill so-and-so because they knew that. These high-end family, kids of these families. I mean, I can look at it from a spiritual perspective or just a conspiracy perspective, but the point is, is that, you know, from a, it's fascinating from a military perspective because a lot of these people knew too much. I mean, they understood. They had, you know, danced with the devil, if you will. They, they sold out to the beast. I don't, you could put it in whatever terms you like, but they, they were owned in some way. And, um, you know, perhaps that's why their lives were taken, to, to silence them or to silence others. Now, let's just take the case of, of this Eric Burden connection of Eric Burden and the Animals, obviously, great, you know, big-time artist of the 60s, uh, and the connection to Jimi Hendrix, the time that Jimi's death, I'm just diving in on one thing. Um, when Jimi had his death, okay, uh, the first person called by his girlfriend, Monica Danneman, who was the last to see Hendrix alive, was Eric Burden of the Animals, and he re- had relocated to L.A. to take over ringmaster duties, you say, from Frank Zappa after Zappa had vacated the log cabin. Okay, just in that 
little part of a paragraph, there's an implication, and my mind just starts reeling about this. Okay, who is Eric Burden then to to Hendricks, and 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 is there a military connection there? And I know there is, but I just want to hear what you have to say about that. I mean, was was Burden somehow a senior officer in this, or was Burden calling in the execution of? Was Jimmy executed? What are you? I thoughts? believe that he was. Yeah, I uh, I don't believe that his death was accidental. Um, I can't really recall off the offhand what the Eric Burden connection was. Actually, I did. Okay. I think they didn't they share a manager or something uh, who was who used to boast of uh, CIA connections or right, something. Right, right, right. You've got that. And then he he died not long after in some kind of a uh, curious plane crash. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't. I can't really recall all the details. Okay. There's but, so much. I mean, there's so much the material but, in this series. I think I'm up to like chapter eighteen it's, or it's something un, like it's that. Unbelievable. I'm not even sure. And yeah, uh, yeah some of it I can't. <laughs> I would love to just follow Burden and see the connection to Hendricks around and see a movie about that because I mean, right there you've got all these players connected. It's almost like wherever you go, okay, wherever you jump into the information, it connects to everybody else. In some yeah, way. everything is connected to everything. It's a very hard story to tell. In in sort of a, that was one of the problems I had with with even trying to tell the story because you can't really tell it in any kind of a linear fashion because everything's connected to everything else and you know, it just weaves in and out. And you you know you start off with on um, in one direction, then you go off on a tangent and another tangent, and eventually you circle back to where you started. You know and. So it's uh, yeah, it's a very twisted okay. and convoluted tale yeah. with uh, a yeah. lot of connections between a lot of these people on many different levels. And uh, yeah, I, one of the questions that I, that I get a lot is is you know if if these people were were whacked, does that mean that they were the good guys? You know, I mean, is, were they were they the the good people that were get, getting silenced? And and I don't know that that's necessarily the case because a lot of the people that ended up dead had the same military intelligence connections as as the people that made it through and um i believe that that to the people at the top of the food chain uh, they they consider these people expendable you know whether they're insiders or not uh if they become you know as long as they're you know, as long as they're doing what they're doing, what they're supposed to be doing, then you know that's all well and good. But if they at some point become a liability, mm-hmm. I don't think that the people at the top have any qualms whatsoever about eliminating them, whether they're insiders or not. You know, right? It it just so. seems like it's automatic. I mean, if you follow the burden thing a little further, you know, yeah, you have the manager, uh, Michael Jeffrey, and then you know he and it, he's siphoning off money from Hendricks. And um, after Hendrix's death, and he's managing Burden as well, so I guess that's that's the connection. And then um, y- you know he's he's tied to organized crime, which most big families are. Um, also working for the CIA, and then his plane goes down. Um, and then the girl uh, that the girlfriend or the um, and this is just too amazing. It it cannot be coincidental. Uh, the girlfriend uh, also dives out of a window. And kills herself. Who would have information from Jimi Hendrix, um, uh, underage prostitute named Devon Wilson, who had been with Jimmy the day before his death, plunged out of an eight-floor window in New York's Chelsea Hotel. Yeah, and- yeah, she, uh, yeah, she, she, her, and the manager, and uh, but Burton, his girlfriend, her common law wife, or something, didn't she yeah. turn up dead? Also, right, right. So the, any kind of witness to what anything Hendrix would have said about what ever was going on if they hadn't you know that's the way it looks to me any connection they just want to make sure they snuff it out so that there is no trail if there yeah is- yeah uh, a lot of a lot of these deaths uh, just reek of uh cleanup operations damage control and uh and, and there's the- frequently other other uh deaths so you know, and, connected to it, and this is uh, a, like you say, yeah. It's uh, but but then just following. Yeah, the gym- they got they got to plug the leak, and they'll take out anyone and as many as they deem necessary. You know, in order to do that, um, what, that's the way I see it. Anyway, yeah. you know, from from my seat. Well, for all the people that I've talked to about, and the things I know about military intelligence, psyops, and all those kind of things. 
um, you know, and the kind of, you know, hit squads that are out there. Yeah, uh, all that is is certainly possible. But it's just hard to, I think, for people to get their mind around this idea that this this whole thing that really spurred on a cultural movement of music, you know, that most people got hooked on all these albums and all the, you know, and, and there was also a connection to um, uh, radio, uh, uh, B. Mitchell Reed, the... the um, DJ, I don't know if you remember him getting, he, he came out with, uh, that was the, the first real FM station, and he had something with uh, Joni Mitchell, but it was really the birth of FM, if you will. Uh, and all of that happened, was while all that is going on, um, it's just mind-boggling to think that the whole thing is tainted by the whole thing, is t- all of it, and all these artists, and all the household names are that tainted. And then I, I suppose the ones who are left alive who obviously know something, they're having to be just, I guess, every day of their lives, hope that someone doesn't sneak up behind them and put two in the head, right? I mean... <laughs> Probably so, to some geez. extent, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was a scary it was a scary place uh, around in and around Laurel Did, Canyon. I mean, people were getting, people were getting bumped off, like, all the time. Yeah, it was, yeah, uh, no. It was uncanny. That's that's you know, and, and uh, of course most of them were written off as suicides or overdoses or accidents or whatever. But you know, if you if you really look at them and start scratching beneath the surface, uh, they don't really look like accidents or suicides, you know. So um, mm-hmm. yeah, I uh, I would imagine there's still people to this day that uh, kind of look over their shoulder every now and then, you know. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I mean, whether you take Keith Moon or whether you take you know, uh, Cass Elliott, you take all these different people. I mean, you know, the whole list of people. And uh, I guess this conspiracy just went to the wayside, sort of like the, the Kennedy conspiracy or any of the other ones. It never really got resolved. But I think you've done um, enough here to show that obviously it's way beyond coincidence and that the entire music industry, and indeed, it points to the entire entertainment industry. As being owned yeah, and operated. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, and also, I mean, the fact that there were so many um, government operations that were known to be going on right there in the same little canyon, you know, uh, the Lookout Mountain Laboratory, which was this top secret, uh, covert, supposedly a film lab, a film production facility, but, you know, God knows what all else they were doing mm-hmm, there, mm-hmm. Right, in the, right in the heart of, of Laurel Canyon. And then there was a, uh, a male prostitution ring that, according to the, the uh, guys that worked there, when they were interviewed by the LAPD, they named, uh, you know, top political and law enforcement, you know, government officials as being among their clientele, you know, very similar to... Uh, cowboy cases that have, you know, popped up in Washington, D.C. every now and then. Mm-hmm. And, you know, various other things. So, you know, you have this, this one little isolated neighborhood of, of Los Angeles where all of these rock stars and young actors and actresses all decided to congregate, and they all just happened to be the sons and daughters of the military intelligence community, and they all just happened to be clustered around these covert... <laughs> <laughs> uh, intelligence, military intelligence facilities. And, you know, I mean, I don't know how anybody could look at that situation and come to the conclusion that that's all just some big coincidence, you know? No, I mean, there's no, just too no, many, no. there's just too many facts, too many things coming together, too many, too many, uh, you know, too many threads woven through this story for it to all be just, you know. Everyone is connected to everyone else. Everything then leads to, you know, the military-industrial complex. All that leads to um, even more nefarious stories out there about uh, Operation Paperclip and, you know, the use of LSD, mind control, psyops, and then ultimately traumatizing and psyoping the American public, like you said, away from the war, but then other things, you know. Um, oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah. I mean, my 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 most recent book was. Uh, um, I mean, it covers uh, you know a lot of uh, very controversial subjects: uh, mind control, Satanism, uh, you know, uh, 
organized pedophilia, ritual yeah. abuse, all this kind of it's stuff. It's all it's all connected, and let's let's go. Yeah, into the- and in my book, it's sort of woven through the stories of these uh, what we know as serial killers, which which uh, I don't believe uh, you know the. the Public, you know, opinion, the the, the mass, uh, you know, opinion of what a serial killer is is accurate at all, and that that's sort of the subject of my last book. Mm-hmm. But what what uh, what fascinated me was that all of those very same threads, you know, the occultism, the you know, the pedophilia, yeah. the, the mind control, all of the mil- you know, military intelligence connections, all of this stuff that wove through that book also. The very same threads are woven through this Laurel Canyon story over and over and over. And, uh, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. everything is connected. It's, it's, it's not like the, I mean, I'm, I'm more and more of the opinion that it's not just a whole bunch of little uh, disconnected conspiracies that have mm-hmm. gone on and continue to go on. It's all pretty much one. It's one. It, it, conspiracy yeah. with a lot of tentacles and, I mean, it's yeah, one conspiracy. Kinda, all roads point in the same direction. Right. The, you, you take, in the final analysis. Sure. You take the pedophilia angle. You take the Satanism angle. Satanism, of course, is mind control. So, you know, basically, satanic initiation involves mind control, multiple personalities. Kids are indoctrinated. Yeah. Kids are indoctrinated. With pedophilia, too. I mean, yeah, it's all about trauma. It's all about conditioning the kids for the. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, okay. all, it's all the same thing. You all know? right. Like, so, yeah. The, the, Exactly. It's it's uh, the Satanism, the pedophilia, the mind control. They're all they all run together. Could it be then? I mean, you know, what it all points to is: is there a human group sitting there in a little boardroom somewhere organizing all this, or is this a lot of this being organized from a spiritual perspective, where they're caught up and just like programmed to do what they do, and they're all just you know in an interconnected way doing what they do when you're part of that world? But it's it's horrifying to see who. Okay, let's call it a game, The Game. I mean, there's a movie called The Game with Michael Douglas and Sean Penn, which I think is kind of looks like this, <laughs> you know, if you recall that. I remember that. that. I remember when it yeah. came out. I don't recall if I ever saw it or not. Well, I, I would never. recommend it to you, and I think it would blow your mind after the research you've done to see something actually in film where someone tries to describe it. Oh, at, really? As, oh. Like, as like a, yeah, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the opposite end of this thing, is that okay? If they want you, if they want to recruit you, and you don't want to join, um, you know, good luck on being alive. If they if they want to pursue it, you know, there's that angle. The other angle is a lot of these people are were indoctrinated as children. You know, they they've come into it as uh, uh, you know children. They sort of owned and operated. That's how they put their people into these positions because they're programmed to do it. Also. Sometimes mind control programming can bring out incredible talents in people, especially trauma-based mind control. Um, oh, absolutely! Yeah, I mean that—that's that, another question that, that people that they say, "Well, are you saying that these these people don't have talent? That they, they that they were just put into this position because of their connections and began to promote this agenda?" Or nurture? Uh, no, absolutely. Obviously, I mean, Jimi Hendrix was just <laughs> to this day. I, I, this is the music that I grew up on. Yeah, I too. know that these people, a lot of these, Frank Zappa was, was an incredible musician, yeah, you know, Jimmy yeah. Hen, a lot of these people were. And, uh, but, you know, my question is, were they groomed for that practically from the day that they were born? Is that why they were such mm-hmm. virtuoso mu- musicians? The, and I think it probably is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think it's very much a, a self-perpetuating system and then, uh, with the, you know, that begins with the abuse of children, yeah, and then they grow up to become abusers themselves. And most of these people who are uh, the quote-unquote controllers they're victims themselves, you know. I mean, they're all being they're all being manipulated by hidden puppet masters, and the, the puppet masters are themselves the victims of higher up puppet masters. Yes, you know what I mean. Absolutely. So it's I think it's very much a self perpetuating system. So yeah, if you, don't don't feel so bad if you didn't become that rock star because basically you know, and then we go to <laughs> more modern examples like, for example, we have Kurt Cobain. An extremely talented, uh, you know, singer-songwriter that was just coming into his potential. We we also see, you know, this idea of Satanism. And let me just draw the connection. And, and don't don't please don't 
he's not signing on to what I'm saying. What I'm saying is what I'm, what he's saying is what he says. But if, if I make a spiritual connection between say the death of uh, Kurt Cobain and the rise suddenly of, um, you know, semi-talented, uh, Courtney Love, <laughs> I just, you know, from, from all of a sudden nowhere to going into these movies and all that after his death, you do see, you know, the girlfriend dies and all of a sudden the other artist, you know, the one left behind goes, he goes up. Have you noticed? Yeah, I don't. Uh, Courtney Love. I don't know what what is going on with that. I mean, she, I I want to know, you know where she came from, what her connections are, because uh, I find it just astounding that she managed to get close to like so many of the guys who would emerge as the sort of stars of the uh, I guess I don't know if it was the eighties or nineties music scene. You know, yeah. I mean, she. Uh, Kurt Cobain, you know, with Nirvana, Scott Weiland, Weiland with the Stone Temple Pilots, right. Trent Reznor with Nine Inch Nails, Evan Dando. There's a whole other, head. yeah, a whole other story there. I mean, just how did this one girl manage to get so close to every one of these guys who just happened to, you know, and if, I don't know if you've seen the documentary film yeah, I did. Uh, on the death. Of, I think it's called Curtin Curtin Courtney. Curtin Courtney. Or... It's straight straightforward documentary. And I'm sorry By if I don't. With, uh, right. Right. where they My... interview the guy who was in like some death metal band or something who said that Courtney Love approached him about whacking Kurt. And then like uh, – during the making of the film, that guy, that guy himself uh, got hit by a train or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. See, and, that's what I'm talking about. In other words, it seems like this, all this that you wrote about, about Laurel Canyon, is perpetuating into the, we see it into the ni- all the way into the 90s now, and it's kind of diffuse. Let me ask you a question about the canyon itself and talk a little bit about the geography. Do you feel there's any sinister element in Laurel Canyon today, or is it just a thing of history? I don't, you know, I get a really weird vibe when I go up there now, and I've, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time up there, as I said. I've, I went and photographed a lot of these houses and stuff, and uh, I get a really weird vibe from it now, but I don't I don't know if that's just me, you know, because I got all of this stuff floating around in my head now, you know, because mm-hmm. before, I mean, I, I've driven through the canyons all of my adult life. Uh, you know, I work a lot of times over on the west side, and the quickest way there, and my wife uh, does also, and the quickest way there from here is straight through the canyons, either Laurel or Coldwater Canyon. Yeah. So I've been driving through them all of my adult life and never gave it a second thought, and well, never seemed, you know, let's exp- uh, I actually thought how much I'd like to live there. I mean, because mm-hmm. it's, it's, compared to the rest of L.A., it's just this, you know, beautiful, very serene, bucolic uh, yeah. You well, know, I mean, you got these just rugged landscape and yeah. natural vegetation and wildlife, and I mean, it's very far removed from the L.A. basin. Right. Uh, you know, not not distance wise, but I mean, it's just it's a it's a whole other world up there. Yeah, it's a, and, that, the and I always really liked it up there, yeah. and now I get a really dark vibe when I go through there, and you know, I don't know if that's just me or. <laughs> I enjoyed. Or it I, definitely has a bad vibe to me now. Yeah, I, there was a bad vibe throughout. I mean, you realize that – let's give the audience just a little bit of a, a breakdown here. You know, Mulholland Drive kind of connects. It, it sort of bisects the valley and the west side, and you have canyons. You know, it's, it's like up on a mountain, so you have canyons through there. So you've got Laurel Canyon and, and as David mentioned, uh, Coldwater Canyon. You've got um, – Beverly Glen, and then, you know, eventually, you know, you've got Malibu Canyon, Topanga Canyon, these various canyons yeah. that go through. And they all of these have attracted, you know, you also mentioned Malibu quite a lot, the Malibu connection here to Laurel Canyon. Um, you know, we also have the Mulholland connection, you know, not far from, uh, of course, what's been in the news recently is the uh, Roman Polanski uh, affair, which, of course, that seems light in comparison to all this. But, I mean, that's the kind of milieu the pedophilia, um, satanic milieu. Um, and of course you can't deny these strange connections, at least in a spiritual way, no concrete connection between Manson and, um, Polanski, but you have, you know, Jack Nicholson's house being involved in yeah, this. You, yeah. It happened at Nicholson's house, at, which, with, uh, yeah, with his right, uh, right off Laurel Canyon on Mulholland, right next right. door to 
former Brando estate where all kinds of weirdness happened. Yeah, so you uh, and Gas and uh, which which uh, Nicholson now owns. He actually owns both estates now. And you've got uh, you know yeah that that happened right that happened right there also during that same uh, time frame. Yeah, I mean it was. Uh, a lot, a lot of bad stuff happened in that canyon between, say, 1965 and 1980. I think I understand what it all is. I mean, I can just say this, that it's a microcosm of the world, you know, in a sense, a very heightened, hyper, huge money. It's almost like a point in a, in the in a universe where everything coalesces like an axis point. Um you know, for the entertainment industry and also for politics, you know, for the, the big money, the big, it just happened at, at a point in history, which you pointed out to, to all coalesce at Laurel Canyon and this deception, uh, possibly the hippie movement being a way to make money. N- number one, uh, the game goes on all the deaths, number two, but, but ultimately a way to deflect, um, you know, people from being against the war, of course it had the opposite effect, didn't it? I mean, it, it, it caused people to really criticize the, the war all the more. Uh, to some extent, yeah, yeah, I mean, but, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the battle cry of the hippie movement as voiced by, uh, good old Timothy Leary was, uh, turn on, tune in, drop out, you know, I mean, he, the, the, it was, they were basically, you know, telling people just don't worry about it, just, uh, you know, get high and, you know. So I, I, I think that the, the, a lot of the messages that were promoted uh, within the, the hippie flower child movement were very counterproductive as far as uh, actually, you know, making a difference and, and stopping the war. And, uh, you know, the, a lot of people tend to romanticize that, that era and, uh, and want to believe that the, the countercultural movement, the hippie movement did stop the war but it didn't you know i mean it, it drug on and on and on and uh you know it, it didn't it, we didn't pull out of it till when 1975 four or five yeah it, it's um you know we did pull out of it eventually but i mean you know we're in perpetual war now um and no matter what uh what what the administration is in the the wars continue and it's getting more and more uh, surreal for me personally, and now the Laurel Canyon thing coming back almost to tell me something about my youth because I've the personal interest I have is that I was amongst them, I was there, and I was kind of a what you might call a crack up in that whole thing. And then when I look at this, it's like, well, I feel like they, I should have been killed too for knowing that it was all about pedophilia, Satanism, and uh, you know, and all that. I, I, you know, and I basically told them to F off. And, um, you know, the result was, uh, pretty well ruining my life. And, but yeah, then, you're not as well known these days as, uh, Crosby or stills or, <laughs> now, you know, now, now uh, Crosby, I think I saw him here. I, I, I wish I had a thing to get license plates because I saw a guy exactly look just like him here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, driving right down Cerritos road, the middle of the, that's kind of like the Ventura Boulevard of, uh, Santa Fe. Anyway, and so, you know, and it says Spiritus and there, you know, and it looked exactly like him in a, uh, in an SL Mercedes. And I just thought, uh, w- you know, and then I thought of your connection between another of uh, past resident here, um, Melissa Etheridge. And of course the idea that they used uh, his sperm to make their baby, he, he, her and her partner, uh, he, uh, conceived, I believe in New Mexico. And I, but I know, I don't know if she lives here anymore, but I mean, there are all these kind of New Mexico connections. And then of course, what's in New Mexico, the military industrial complex. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go you can't like get you said, all roads lead there and then who's here val kilmer you know there's rumors of him running for governor and what else is here the hollywood Are you kidding me really uh, he may wind up being the next governor of new mexico yeah and you heard it here first wow he's I being had no idea i actually i mean uh I, I actually admire some of his work. I, I think the guy's a, a hell Me of an too. actor. I, I have no idea what his background is. It's probably not good, but uh, well, I, nobody I, played. That, yeah. He was better than Jim Morrison. I mean, he played so, such a good Jim Morrison that he topped Jim Morrison. <laughs> uh, he was incredible. Yeah, he was also incredible as uh, John Holmes in uh, yep. Wonderland. 
Everything he and, does. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I, I believe that, uh, you know, and, and it, gets, it goes back to the, the mind control stuff, that I believe that, that the reason that, the, you know, the best of, of, Hollywood, of the Hollywood uh, crowd, the reason that they are so good and that they can almost, you know, literally become these characters, and you hear stories all the time about, about uh, actors being so deep into character that they can't uh, leave it aside when they leave the set and whatnot. And I, I believe that the reason that they are so good at that is because they're drawing on their mind control programming. They have all of these alter personalities yeah, they're, they're that they can draw upon to yeah. fill these different roles. You know, if they yeah. have to play this certain character, then, you know, they have a, they an alter identity that they can bring yeah. out that, that fits that role. And mm-hmm. I believe that that's why uh, yeah, I, I, Hollywood is just a, just, a, just a nest of mind control, in my opinion. Yeah, I've... You know, I mean, I've I've also, Especially all of these people, I think. Yeah, I've also. <laughs> that, I believe is the reason that they, you know, and they talk about method acting and, oh, yeah. and getting in character and stand. And, and it's all just euphemisms, basically, for tapping into the 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 programming that they've had. It is amazing, but um, you know, in my way of of looking at it all, it's really no different than it is today. I mean, and you've also gone on to write about you know America. You know, corporate politics, fascism, um, and mind control on a, on a larger scale. And to me, it just seems like, well, these are just more and more levels of it. And they just, you know, anyone that wants to fight it, you know, they just laugh at you and they just like, what are you trying to do? You're fighting the whole world here. You know, this is all connected. This, it's almost like the uh, three days of the condor. You know, the guy goes, well, I'm going to print this. He goes, well, how do you know it'll, if they're going to they're going to run it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to shout to the world this about all this. Well, who's going to listen to you? Yeah, I mean, mind control is pretty much everywhere. It's it, it's all about uh, trauma, you know, and it's most mm-hmm. effective with kids, but it, it's it's effective yeah. to some to some well, degree with everyone. And uh, you know, that's uh, my you know my like I said, my latest, my most recent book, which isn't really that recent, but uh, well, let's on serial killers, and I, I think mind control operates on on several levels there, uh, most of these people themselves show clear evidence of being mind control victims and their crimes in it to, to some degree are, are, uh, attempts to, you know, control the public by, by traumatizing the public at large with these, you know, heinous crimes. Well, just like you have in your, your book program to kill the politics of serial murder. I mean, you know, obviously, there's all kinds of you know. There's the surface story about these serial killers, and then there, then I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm thinking that what you're doing is just linking it all into a much bigger picture. Um, you know, I I haven't read the book yet, but I really want to read it. Looking at the blurb here, you know, and the other one, fascism and the politics of illusion. Uh, that's a, amazing. Understanding the F word. Um, you know, another, uh, you know, th- these just look like the most timely books for today. You can imagine derailing democracy. Uh, the America, the media d- d- does not want you to see uh, by David McGowan. And um, I would think that these would be. Well, there will be a day, um, David, I, I, I'm pretty sure where these will be more widely read as society breaks down further, I think a lot of people are just in denial. They don't really, really want to know all this stuff. They don't want to know that they're heroes and they're actors and they're musicians, the music they grew up on, that the whole thing has been Alice in Wonderland. They don't want to, to they don't want you to ruin that for them. Oh, I know. I mean, yeah. I mean, and I struggle with that myself. You know, like I said, these are, you know, I, I was actually a child of the seventies, but the music of the seventies pretty much sucked. So I, you know, the, the, the six, the bands of the sixties were very much, uh, that was very much the soundtrack to my youth. And, uh, you know, I had a huge admiration for a lot of these people and it's, uh, it's very hard to let that go. That's that's one of the hardest things about uh, How, you know pursuing this these kind of lines of research is, yeah, is watching yeah. so many of your hero your former heroes fall by the wayside. Yeah, well, all heroes have feet of clay. Now everyone should know that by now. I mean, it's it's <laughs> a, we're all flawed, folks. I mean, but uh, David McGowan definitely his voice he really deserves to get out there. I think Laurel Canyon. You know what it is to me. It's like. Uh, I talked about at the last show I was on. It was a, 
it's almost like an ant farm microcosm that we can look at to see how things work, you know, to see the interplay of commerce and art and, and the arts and, and, you know, and, and these odd murders. Do you think, and this is my last question because I know we're right out of time. So do you think that most of the murders were because they knew something or do you think some of them were just because they wanted someone to murder or they wanted them out of the way? I mean, is there any central theme on the, uh, on the deaths? I, I think it's probably a combination of those factors. I think some of them had probably become liabilities. Maybe they knew too much or they had, uh, you know, decided that they, uh, you know, realized that they were working for the dark side, or, you know, whatever, and they had to be disposed of. And uh, probably others, maybe just for the uh, the sensationalism and and the trauma that it inflicts on, on the American people. You know, I mean, I yeah. I believe kind of unrelated, but but I believe that was one of the main motivations for taking out Kennedy was that, and and I kind of thought that that they might be pursuing the same program actually with Obama and that the people were the American people at large were sort of openly encouraged to really sort of idolize this guy uh, Kennedy and, and consider him almost like a, a member of the family so I mean his death was just hugely traumatic to the American people and uh, I thought I, th- I actually thought that, that that they were setting up Obama to do the same it thing. makes you mad so, it, it, yeah <laughs> It makes you mad. It makes me mad personally, just because I've, you know, I've. Well, but you've, you've, you kind of put the last. Uh, the the your research is so overwhelmingly good that there is no doubt in my mind as to any of the any of the things that I thought, any of the things I was persecuted for feeling or thinking, and told it was wrong thinking. You know, I mean, my you know, all the brainwashing that I went through personally because of the fact that that I knew something and they tried to brainwash that out of me. It was all true. And, but it was a lot worse than I thought after reading your research, when I just see the not, not, not Dave's opinion here. It's <laughs> David McGowan's information, just the list of things. And then when we get to link letter, well, there's some personal things with that that I can share with you later, but not, not really yet for public consumption. It's just, uh, you know, in a way uh, you don't know this, but you've, you know, you've helped me, you know, put this thing into perspective and, and, and be grateful that I escaped L.A. in one piece. <laughs> My guest today has been David McGowan. Please stay right there, and I just want to have a word with you after, okay? Okay. Would that be okay with you? Just just a, a minute. Okay, David McGowan, my guest, I thank you for uh, being with us. This is Zeph Daniel, the Zeph Report.